Pastor Kevin mentioned that we've been in a um, series that we took a pause because we had the financial fitness, but we've been in a series um, studying the names of God. When we look at the names of God, it contributes to an attribute of God, a character, a way of God. In the Old Testament, you would see the word in our English translation is always being, the name of God is always being translated as God or Lord. Those are pretty general names that we see throughout scripture. But when we look at the original Hebrew language, we would see that throughout the Old Testament, when it mentions God or Lord, there is actually a name that depicts a characteristic of God, um, um, indicative of that situation or his relationship to a person or an event or a people. And so that's why we're taking the time to study the names of God because the more we understand God in his name form, the better we can understand the nature of God, the characteristics of God. We, we want to get to know the God that we say we serve, yeah? And so it's so important for us to understand who is this God, the eternal one, who is he? Pastor Kevin started out week one um, on the majesty of God. And that doesn't, it's not in, um, um, pointing to a name as it is an essence of God Almighty. Majesty, what is that? He's majestic. He puts you in awe of him, wonder, splendid. You, you know, I, as I was studying, preparing for this, what I realized is that theology is the study of God. Your finite mind, my finite mind, cannot fully wrap around an infinite God. The more you study God, the, the more you realize you just don't know much. You understand how small you are in the, in the grand scheme of this mighty, massive God. It doesn't matter if you're a theo theologian, it doesn't matter if you were raised in the church, if you study, if you've gone to seminary, all those things, it's, it's, it's a drop in a bucket. You're barely scratching the surface of this majestic God. And I'm so glad that's the case. I'm glad that I don't, I don't serve a God that I can fit in my mind. That he can fit within the cerebral cortex, the, the corners of my mind. I, I don't want to serve a God that I can fully understand and explain to, like this. No, I want to serve a big God, a mighty God, a majestic God, a great God. Because if he's great, then anything I go through, he's greater than. That's the kind of God I want to serve. I'm glad we don't serve God that I created with my hands. I'm glad I don't serve a God that, that is up in the sky like stars and I'm worshiping the stars. No, that's a created thing. I serve, we serve the creator, the one who created that thing, right? So tonight we're going to look at one of the names. It's actually the first name given to us in scripture, the very first one found in Genesis 1. Typically, I would ask you to stand for the reading of the word, but I won't because I want us to read a passage of scripture, and it's not in your outline. I just have a few verses in your outline, but it's not in your outline. So I'm going to read over it a little bit. I'm going to probably skip through some just to get to the main areas that um, we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to start Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning. Scripture says, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above, clouds and such. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. 
Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, and so forth and so, so on. And it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, stars and such. And let them be signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the great light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God blessed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. I'm going to skip down. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with the swarms of the living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the sea monsters and every living creatures that moves with which the water swarmed after its kind and every wing bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them in saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters in the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Then God said, then God said, let the, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us. All the other scriptures, God spoke to it and it came. But only here. Then God said, let us make man in our image. God speaks to himself to create mankind. Everything he said, let there be. From the expanse, the birds, the fields, the earth, the water, all of that. But when it got to mankind, God had to speak to himself to create you and to create me. Let us make man in our image. Now, here is where we get something. Us there is called, the name of God is Elohim. Elohim, we're gonna study that tonight. The name Elohim, we're gonna break that down. According to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, of the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and every creeping thing going on. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea of the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves. Then God said, behold, I have given every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, every tree yielding seed it. It shall be food for you and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life. I have given every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. Every other day, it was good. But on the sixth day, when he created man, he said, not that it was good, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. It's true, it's active, it's living, it's powerful, God. Lord, we know so little. We try to wrap our minds around who you are, but our finite minds can't fully understand the fullness of who you are. But, oh God, you've given us your word to teach us what we know not. Lord, you said that you will make known to us the hidden things, the secret things. You will make them known to us, Lord. Tonight, we come as students to your very word. Would you teach us, Holy Spirit? Teach us the things that we don't know. Help us to understand. We, we pray for revelation tonight, God. We just don't want information. Mm -mm. We want a revelation of who you are because revelation leads to transformation. And that's what we're after, God. 
transform us, mold us, make us, Lord God, again and again, over and over. Take out the things in us that don't belong, the things that hinder us, Lord, and create in us a clean heart and a right spirit on the inside of us, God. Lord, we're your servants. We come to you and say, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen and amen. You know, there's this thing of branding, branding. When you brand something, you can brand a corporation, an organization. You can brand a product. You can brand just about anything. The thing about branding is it's not so much about the logo or a slogan. You're helping people to understand who you are and what you're about. They're getting a better understand of you, your methods, your services, how you relate, how you function, and what you do. God's name is a brand. He brands his name. It's not merely words that we read in scripture. People may try to hijack God's name and misuse it for all types of self-serving endeavors, but God's names are spiritually trademarked. In other words, you can try to use the name of God, but if you use it illegitimately, you won't have the power and the authority attached to it because you're using it illegitimately. Attached to each one of God's name is a set of characteristics qualities, promises, meanings. God uses specific names in, to define himself in light of what you can learn about him. When we see the name of God in scripture, the original language, like I said, it discloses something about God, which is so important for us to understand that because we want to understand who is he in his ways. The first book in the Bible we just read the first chapter. Every time you saw the name God in that chapter, it's Elohim. God doesn't introduce any other name until chapter 2. But everything concerning the name of God that you saw in the entire chapter 1, when you say, and when you saw in the beginning God, well, it was actually in the beginning Elohim. Elohim said it was good. Elohim saw and it was good. Elohim is the name. What does the name Elohim means? It means the strong creator. The strong creator. In this one line, Jesus is saying, when God is saying, when he says, in the beginning, God, or in the beginning, Elohim, in that one line, what God was doing for us, he was introducing himself to us. So in other words, he's saying, hello, I am Elohim. So as you're reading it, he's introducing who he is to you. And so the question is, why would God introduce himself to mankind as Elohim? Why is that the first thing that he uses or the first name that he uses to introduce mankind? And here is where we're going to, everyone has an outline, yes? Everyone, hopefully you have an outline. If you don't have an outline, you can just kindly raise your hand and someone from the red carpet team will get it to you because you're going to need that tonight. The first thing we want to understand of why God would introduce himself as Elohim is that, number one, God wants us to know that he is transcendent. Listen, tonight, church, we got to get an understanding of the God we say we serve. He's bigger than we think. When I understand the kind of God that I say I serve, I move differently. I process differently. I go through problems differently. My perspectives are changed because I'm viewing my situation through the lens of the God that I know and serve. So all of a sudden, the thing that looks so big, yes, it looks big when I view it through my own carnal eyes, but when I pull out and view it through the eyes of Elohim, I realize that it's a small thing to the mighty God that I serve. Amen. He's transcendent. What does that mean? Meaning he's distinct from his creation. Rather than being a part of creation, he sits above his creation. That's why heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. He puts his feet on earth. His toes, so to speak, on planet earth. Secondly, underneath transcendent 
He transcends time. Who? He transcends time. It says in Genesis chapter 1, 1 1a, in the beginning, God created. So he created the beginning. If God created time, he had to precede it in order to create it. He couldn't have created something that was already created. So he created the beginning. He created time. So when you and I discuss time, we discuss it from a linear perspective. So we say uh, 7 o'clock, 3 o'clock, or Monday through Sunday, or um, January through December, or hours, or weeks, or months. We can't fit God inside of that because he fits Beyond, he sees beyond the time that we construct in our minds to, to weigh the, the day, when I go to sleep, when I get up. God sits above that. He created time. He sits outside of time. God is present now and always. You see, you and I have yesterday and tomorrow. God is always and always will be. We're talking about time. He transcends it. So he is always and always will be. He is the I am. You know what that means? Present tense. Always. He is right now. That's why he told Moses, tell them I am sent you. That is in the now he's referring to himself. Yesterday he was now. Today he was now. He is now. And forevermore he is now. He's the eternal God. He doesn't fit in our cortex of time. He sits out, oh, come on, church. We got to understand this God. He is mighty. So he's, he's, he's the I am, not I was or I will be, but right now I am ever present. He transcends time. So for us, we go to God with urgent prayer requests. God, I need this now. God, you got to come through now. We look at the time. We look at, well, oh, it's, it's due now. It's due now. And God says, it's a problem for you, not a problem for me. I created the time you're worried about. You're telling me I got to do, it got to be now, it got to be now. No, no, I sit above it. I know when to do it. No wonder we can say in impatience and in our angst, he tells us, be still and know. I know you're worried about that and you're thinking the time is running out and you're thinking, where is it going? He can look at you and tell you, just be still. You know what that means? Chillax, relax, cease striving. Be still and know what? That I am God. I'm Elohim. I created this thing. God not only transcends time, he transcends space. God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 1b, it says, he predates creation. Before God created mankind, he created a location, a space by which mankind would fit in. He comes before the things he created. In order for God to create space, he had to sit outside of it and say, let there be. So he, 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 he sits, he comes before the thing that he created. He existed when space did not exist. We don't know anything beyond the earth and the first heavens. First heavens, I hope you all know the heavens, right? First, second, third, first heavens is like what we see, the stars, the skies, you know, just the sky above. Second heavens is where the, uh, I know it's not a good teaching probably for tonight. Dominion atmosphere, demonic atmosphere normally takes place in the second heavens. This is where people start doing with horoscopes and all that other stuff. But that's the principalities of the air and all of that. That's the second heavens. Then you have the third heavens. Remember Paul said he was caught up in the third heavens. That's heaven. That's where dimension, the dimension of God is. He created all of that. And so he sits above the heavens, the scripture says. So we exist in space. God exists outside of all of that. Let me explain this to you. Scientists tell us there's our, there are 100 billion to 200 billion galaxies that they believe they have discovered. And each galaxy has up to, each galaxy has up to 100 billion stars in it. 
Andromeda is one of the closest galaxies to our galaxy. And close meaning it is 2.2 million light years away from our galaxy. Light travels at 186,000 miles, we know that, per second. So to explain it in our terms, if you had a friend that lived on Andro Andromeda, and you wanted to get a message to your friend on Andromeda, and light, say, the message would travel at the speed of a radio wave, which that speed travels seven times around the Earth per second. That's the speed of a radio wave. So if I was sending a, a, a message to my friend at, on Andromeda and it's tr my message is traveling at the speed of a radio wave, it will take me, my message to get to my friend five million years. And God said, let there be. He just spoke that into existence. And it was. Could you imagine if God would have shouted? God spoke such an, and that's just one galaxy. There are billions of galaxies that God just spoke. The Bible says he breathes out stars and calls them by name. We don't even know all the stars that are out there. And God, Elohim, created them and calls them by name. This is your God and my God. In fact, this is why God marvels when we are unbelieving. It, it, it makes him tilt his head when we are disbelieving, when we, when we lack faith. You remember uh, Sarah and Abraham? Sarah was beyond age, and he told her that she would have a child, and they didn't believe that the child, that, that her womb could carry such a child. And here's what God said to them in Genesis 18, 14. He said, is anything too difficult for me? He looks at Abraham and Sarah. They were beyond logic of having a child. Beyond the years of childbearing. And he looks at them and says, in other words, what's too difficult for me to do? If I can create all those galaxies that you don't even know about, what's a womb that I can't put a baby in? You remember when he went to Mary? The angel went to Mary and told her that she was going to be with child and carry the Savior. Luke 137, when Mary wondered how a virgin could bear a child, the angel addressed her squarely and says, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. I want you to think of that verse when you see your situation. When you think about that problem in your life, the angel says to us today, nothing will be impossible for God. The God you serve, I don't care how big it is, I don't care how the situation looks, it looks the doctor's report, it doesn't matter. He says nothing will be impossible for the God that you and I serve. I'm telling you, whatever the mountain of the situation is that you're facing, whatever that challenge is that seems like it's killing you, whatever the circumstances is, you gotta look at the circumstance and say, nothing is impossible for my God, nothing. He can do anything. He creates out of nothing. He just speaks it and it is so. The third thing is God transcends not just time, space, but he also transcends matter. He sits outside the physical components of the universe, matter. In order for God to exist outside of time, space, and matter, he must exist in another dimension that is not tied to time, space, and matter. We do not have a clue fully of what that dimension is like, but the scripture gives us a little glimpse here and there of that dimension. He fills, while he's, he sits outside of time, space, and matter, the scripture also lets us know in Jeremiah that he fills the heavens and the earth. He's not subjected to it but yet he fills the heavens and the earth. 
Jeremiah 23, verse 23 says that he fills the heavens and the earth. This tells us that not only is God transcendent, but he's also imminent. I know I'm giving you some words tonight, but it's okay. He's also imminent here, there, and everywhere. He is everywhere present. The theologian word for that is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He fills creation. He sits outside of it. He's in it. He's above it. He's, I mean, he's all, that's why the psalmist says, where can I go from your presence? If I fly on the wings of them, I can't hide from you. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. That is the God we serve. A good illustration for this would be air. Air is, exists everywhere on earth. Wherever you go, you would be in the atmosphere of air. But the illustration breaks down when you leave gravity. When you leave gravity, you no longer have, have the air that you and I need to survive. Yet, when you leave God's presence on earth and you go up into the sky and land on another planet, thou art there. He's there. That's why another name for God is Jehovah Shammah. We're going to look at that on another night. Jehovah Shammah. It means the Lord is there. Where? Wherever you are, he is. Where you're not, he's there too. He sends you to go ahead. He's up ahead of you waiting for you while he's walking with you to get there. Come on. He is Jehovah Shammah. He is everywhere. He is with you wherever you go. Anywhere he sends you, God has already gone ahead to prepare it for you. Genesis 1, 2 to 3 says the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. It was a waste, garbage, Unin uninhabitable. It was the result of Satan and his fallen angels. And the planet became a wasteland. Whoo, here we go. But the Bible says Elohim began to, began to hover over the chaos, over the wasteland. And life is a, is a, was the result of the Spirit of God hovering over what looked like a mess. God restored it. He brought light to it. He separated water from land, from land and then he made earth livable. What does that, does that tell us about God? It tells us that he's a restorer. He restores things. He takes what the enemy has messed up and cleans it up. Come on. Right? He takes what was messed up. Hey, come on. That should be all of us. And he cleans it up. He makes dead things come alive. He brings light where there is darkness. He is a restorer. So what the enemy is trying to do, Satan messing up things, God comes in and restores it. So what that tells us, he makes all things new in your life and in my life. That should give somebody in here hope because only Elohim can turn a mess into a miracle. Only Elohim can do something like that. His name is Elohim. Elohim. And when he transcends our lives and turns what was darkness in our life to light, he then wants you to reflect him. Genesis 1:26 tells us, then God said, let us make man in our what? Image, according to our likeness. What is an image? An image is a mirror. So if you go to your mirror, and images, if you go to your mirror, you will see an image flash back at you. The flowers were not created in God's image. Mm -mm. The beasts, they weren't created in God's image. The fish wasn't created in God's image. Only man was created with the capacity to mirror God, to reflect God Almighty. Everything else can validate God, glorify God, but man is the only one that was created in his image to reflect God Almighty. 
We're supposed to mirror God because he has put his image stamped on us. We are commissioned high, at a higher level than any other thing created in all creation. Only mankind has been given the privilege and the honor and the capacity to mirror God Almighty. No wonder the psalmist says, what is a man that thou art mindful of us? Why would you look upon us in such love and kindness and mercy? And I don't know the reason for that. All we know is that God says that you are the apple of his eye. This great, majestic, mighty, powerful God says you are the apple of his eyes. That when he sees you, he sees the beloved. His love towards you is full, running over, bubbling. You've heard me say it before. The scripture says that his thoughts towards you outnumbers the sand on the seashore. Which seashore, Pastor Nadine? All of them. It outnumbers, that's his thoughts toward you, not just once, all the time. That, that's God's thoughts toward you. All creation testifies of God's glory. We get to mirror him. So how does the fact that he predates time, matter, and space, and the fact that he can restore what Satan messes up, and the fact that we're created in the image of God, how does that help me going home today? I go home, I, perhaps you have to deal with a marital issue. The fact that he's Elohim, he, you're like, I still have a marital issue. You're dealing with a health issue. You're dealing with a financial issue. You're dealing with children issue, a job issue. You're dealing with all these things. After you told me all of that stuff, Pastor Nadine, how does that really, in the grand scheme of my life, how does that play out in everyday detail? I'm glad you asked that question. Chapter 2 says of Genesis, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all the work which God had created and made. By the seventh day... God completed his work. He rested from all his work. Then he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Day one, God created and said, let there be, and it was. Day two, God created and said, let there be, and it was. All the way to day five, and we know it was good. By day six, God makes man in his own image. He spent the first five days getting creation ready for man. He didn't create man day one. Had he created man day one, the earth would have been dark. No night. I mean, no day. So God was specific. The timing of when he created man. He chose to create man on the last day because everything else that was created before man was created for man. This God knows what you need. Matter of fact, he's already prepared it. All we have to do is walk in it. We're asking God for stuff that he's already given to us. The Bible said he created man on day six after he had, after he had fixed earth. Remember, it was messy, it was chaos, and he, the spirit hooved over and, and all this thing came. He's a God of decency and order. He ordered it for you to be able to inhabit it. And then he said it was very good. For, um, the third one I want you to know, God wants us to know that he rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, but because he was finished. He had completed all that he set out to do. He completed what he purposed to do. He, he had a finished work concerning his children. Guess what? He's completed a work concerning you already. Your purpose is already complete. He's already spoken it. It is so. It is done. And it is good. Our job is to step into it. But God has already gone ahead of it. He's already done it. He's already fashioned it. He's already formed it. Now you just have to align with the purpose that God has already spoken concerning your life and my life. 
Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God was finished because he had nothing left to do. He completed what he set out to do. He sanctified the seventh day. What does that mean? He set it apart. It was unique and special. Now God could cease from creation, from creating, because he only has to create once. Once he creates it, it's a perpetuation. He puts in his creation the mechanism needed to continue for it to flow for millions of years. So fish reproduce fish, tree, bear seed, which produce more trees. I mean, all of these things, he put in his creation the ability to continue creation, the mechanism that's needing the power, the perpetuating power that is needed. So in us is the ability of reproduction, to create man, to, to give birth, to give life to man. God has already completed a finished work concerning you. He's already completed it, meaning you're not to try to make God do something, but you should rest knowing he's already done it. It's already been done concerning you. He has already prepared it beforehand, according to Ephesians 2.10 that we just read, that all we need to do is walk in them. Whatever God is going to do for you, he has already done it. You don't have to, oh, God, could you fix this? I got this situation in my life. He's like, I've already done it. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Oh, but I don't know if I'm going to like it. No, it's plans that are good and not evil to bring you to an expected end. He knows what you need. He know- Adam didn't pick Eve. God picked Eve for Adam. Single people, hello. God picked Eve for Adam, and he picked Eve so good for Adam that when Adam woke up out of his sleep and saw Eve, he says, whoa, man. This woman looks good. Bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. I mean, Adam was in his feelings. And he was not a part of creating her Except for a rib that he gave. But God is the one who fashioned her just for Adam. You don't think he knows what you need and what you want and what you like and all of that? Come on. Let's not limit God. We just have to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him and he, and he, will direct our path. Your job is not to make God do anything. He's Elohim. He's the creator. He makes all things. Our job is not to make him do anything. Elohim is the strong creator. He's already created a plan concerning our lives. He has already gone ahead of you concerning it. All we have to do now is walk in it. So how do I do that? How do I walk? You know, I've realized about somebody. I've realized about God. Because, you, you know, God, how do I walk in this, this purpose, this plan, this destiny that you said that you've created for me? I just want, I don't know if I'm off, if, if I'm aligned, I'm not aligned. How do, how do I know? Let me tell you, how do you know? Walk in obedience to God, and it will naturally lead you into the plans and the purposes that he has for your life. That's it. I know it's not... It's just obedience to God. He said obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't give me your offerings. Just give me your obedience. Not for me. For you. So that I can, so through your obedience, because here, here's what God does, right? He doesn't give it to you in your hand. He doesn't place it in your hands. He places it in your reach. So you have to do something to step and walk towards what he has for you. So it's like that child, you know, here you go, you know, the child that's learning how to walk and you're trying to get in front of that child. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're, you're, you, you, you know you don't want them to fall. Maybe they'll fall, but it's okay. You'll lift them up and they, because what you're trying to do is to get the child to do what his legs are purposed to do. 
So God is leading you by your obedience. You're walking towards the purpose and the plans and the destiny that he has for your life. Our problem is our disobedience. Our disobedience obstructs the purposes of God on our lives. It hinders it. It gets in the way of it. And God is saying, if you will just trust and obey, then you will see the majesty. Listen, I know I get in the way too. My attitudes, my disbelief at times, my faith at times, and sometimes the humanness, yes? gets in the way when I see the problem, when you see the bank account is at zero and the, the rent is at 1,200. And you're like, I'm doing the math, God. And it doesn't add up. He said, no, I sit outside of numbers. I'm Elohim. I make something out of nothing. So, Sarah, I know your womb is, is beyond childbearing, but I'm Elohim. I speak and it is so. I put seed inside your womb and it is so. So here comes Isaac. Because God said it. I think God is just after our belief. You know, it wasn't Canaan's soil. It wasn't the giant's on Canaan that stopped the children of Israel from entering the promised land. It wasn't that they were out experienced. It wasn't that they had a poor leadership. What trumped them entering the promised land is that they saw the people in Canaan bigger than Elohim. So they allow what they saw to trump what God said. God told them go and take over and they heard it but when it was time to do it they got paralyzed by what they saw God wants us to see not carnal he wants us to see in the supernatural because that's where his dimension is that's why we can say speak things that are not as though they were because you're a light bearer you are made in the image of God so if he can speak and it is so so can you but as long as you're aligned oh with Elohim oh, church we gotta get you listen I'm looking out here at you guys and some of you are just like I don't know how else to say this. It's what the text says. And until you understand, listen, you're not going to fully understand God. I get that. We don't. But he gives you what you need. Until you believe what he said, then we're going to keep tripping up. We're going to keep stumbling over ourselves because we're not believing what he said, even when it looks impossible. Remember the Red Sea? That was illogical. That trumped science. That's not supposed to happen. Even now they keep trying to explain it away. And God says, I created the sea. I created it. So whatever I tell it to do, it has to do. So if I say part to the right and part to the left and let my people go up on dry ground, guess what it has to do? Part right, part left, walk through on dry ground. That's what God does. So what is it in your life? That's what God is asking you tonight. I said, God, give me your word for your people. What is it that you want to try to, what, what is it that you want to say to them tonight, God? Give me a fresh word for your people. That was my prayer. What is he after? Your belief. CLC. He wants you to believe. The scripture says, all things are possible to those who believe. Oh, it's not working for me. It's not, I believe, I believe, I believe it's not working for me. No, see, when I believe, it affects my behavior. It impacts what I do, how I move, how I react to certain situations coming into my life, how I respond. But first, God has to deal with my, but that's why he says we have to be reprogrammed, transformed by the what? 
the renewing of our minds because we read it but and, and we read it in, in, in comfortable moments and we're excited about it until we run into a problem. Then we forget who Elohim is. No, he's Elohim yesterday, today, and forevermore. When you're gone, he's still Elohim. When the scientists who refute him is no longer here, he's still Elohim. When they change Pluto, oh, you're a planet. No, you're not a planet. He already knew who Pluto was. He created it. He's Elohim. And we have to stand on Elohim no matter what we're going through. Your purpose has a name on it. God has already put your name on your purpose. Your peace has your name on it. The plans that he has for you has your name on it specifically your name on it. God will provide everything you need to align with the plans and the promises that he has for your life. He's Elohim. I'm going to finish up. God says even in seasons of difficulty, he will give his children sweet slumber. Team, you can come. Because he knows that while you're sleeping, the purpose he has for you is still in motion. That's why he can say, sleep, my child, rest, be still. Because no matter what, my purpose is still going to be in motion. You just have to believe it and be obedient to him in the process. He has already purposed and set in motion what he has for you. He is Elohim. When we walk in obedience and trust in God, he will direct our path underneath the shadow of the Almighty who is strong and in control. He's more than able to handle the issues in your life. The thing that you're going through. You know what? God thrives when the thing looks impossible. Because when he does it, you will know for sure that there is a God in heaven. And he's for me. He's on my side. He covers me. He's behind me. He's a shield. He's a buckler. He's my rear guard. He's my strength. He's my advocator. In the courtroom, he's my judge. He's my lawyer. In the hospital, he's my physician. He's Jehovah Rapha. When the finances are lean, he's Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. Is there anything too hard for God when I stand against the mountain, when I stand against the, 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 the giants of life? He comes before you and he says, Nadine, or whatever your name, I'm Jehovah Nisi. I'm the Lord, your banner. I'm your righteousness. I'm your rear guard. I'm your redeemer. I'm your strength. I'm your deliverer. Whatever you need, God says, I am. So don't fret. Don't grow weary. Don't go strained. He says, just be still and know that I am God. Can somebody give God an amen? Hallelujah. Do you know him, church? His name is Elohim, and he's for you, and he's with you. He leads you. He guides you. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways.